Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the LSE for uh, the first day of our Beverage 2.0 Festival, which is taking place throughout this week as part of a whole year of activities for the LSE to think about the future of the welfare state in the 21st century and for a global context. My name is Minou Shafiq, and I'm the director of LSE. So about 75 years ago today, well, not today, 75 years ago this year, <laughs> the Beverage Report, which was the founding document of the UK's modern welfare state, was published. And there were queues just around the corner on the Kingsway as people lined up to get copies. And in that report, William Beveridge, Beveridge declared that there were five giants which had to be vanquished on the road to reconstruction. And these were, and of course, Beveridge was very fond of lists and capital letters. So he, made, he had a list of five things, and they were want, we would call poverty today, ignorance, education, disease, ill health, squalor, housing, and finally, idleness, which was, of course, unemployment. Our Beveridge 2.0 festival uh, at the LSC is here to examine the modern versions of those giants, not just for the present, but also for the future, and not just for the UK, but for the world. But for this opening event, we thought we would take a slightly quirky look at the past. It's quite fashionable for historians now to say that uh, history is more determined by social forces rather than great men or women, but individuals do matter. And so the question, given that Beveridge defined these five giants who over succeeding years have tried to vanquish uh, the, uh, the, the, these giants, the question for tonight is who were the five great ministers, the five political giants, who in one way or another sought to defeat Beveridge's five giants? So that's the question for tonight. Who were the five giant ministers in each of Beveridge's five giant areas? We're going to start the evening with Nicholas Timmons, the author of The Five Giants, a biography of the welfare state, a hugely updated and much expanded version of a book that he published uh, many years ago. And there are copies uh, available in the back. He's also a visiting professor here at the Marshall Institute and the Department of Social Policy. And Nick is going to tell us who his choices would be for the five giants who most advanced Beveridge's agenda. We'll then hear from Julian Legrand. Uh, Julian is a professor here at the Marshall Institute and a longtime member of the LSE family, having served in two academic departments and, uh, and three centers. He's also worked in government as a senior advisor at number 10, uh, working, in fact, with some of the younger giants that Nick will describe. And he'll offer his suggestions as to who to add to the list. And he will also offer a few thoughts on what does it take to make a giant minister? What kind of person can get their ideas through the minefields, swamps, and elephant traps that constitute modern politics? And what are the lessons for those who would like to see radical reform today? And hopefully at the end, there'll be some time for your thoughts and questions. Uh, finally, a few housekeeping matters. For those who are Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's events are hashtag LSE beverage and hashtag LSE festival. And I would ask you to please put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. The event will be recorded and broadcast on a, on a podcast subject to no technical difficulties occurring today. So let me turn over now to Nick. Well, hello, good evening, uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, not just as part of this huge beverage festival, but as one of its opening acts. And it is an opening act because I suspect this will be the uh, only session that essentially involves a parlour game. It's a bit of fun that nonetheless has a serious purpose, to make one think about who has in fact been responsible for what in the 75 years since the Beverage Report, and what, if anything, that might tell you. The idea emerged as I was finishing the update of the five giants, 
you know, who are the five giants. So the game, so to speak, is five by five, a test of both your knowledge of the welfare state's history and mine. Now, like any part of game, this one has rules. Rule one is that prime ministers and chancellors are largely excluded because they, in a sense, are responsible for everything and for nothing. Rule two is that the test is whether ministers made a lasting difference, not necessarily a permanent one, but a lasting one, and not whether that difference they made was for better or for worse, because better or worse will depend deeply on your values and your politics. So to take just one example, some still hanker for the return of grammar schools, and I see Damien Hines, the new education secretary, was raising that only the other day, while others see their decline as one of the great educational achievements. So the test is, did they make a lasting difference whether or not you approve of it? And of course, rule three of parlor games is that everybody breaks the rules, <laughs> as I will as I go through this. And just to add one tiny other point, which is largely for reasons of time, I have excluded pretty much further and higher education. So where do we start? Let's begin with schooling. Giant one has to be Rab Butler. The gentle giant who's so often seen as one of the best prime ministers we never had, and of course he gets it for the 1944 Education Act. This was the one really big part of the welfare state that was enacted before Labour gained power in 1945 to finish the job. It raised the school leaving age from 14 to 15 and provided for it to rise to 16. It produced, not wholly intentionally, the division of children into the gold, the silver, and the iron, as someone wittily rather put it once. In other words, into the grammars, the secondary moderns, and the technical schools that never really happened, while leaving room for comprehensive schools to emerge. It ended all age schooling, and for a generation or more, it settled the religious issue in schools, and it made all schooling free. Thus, tying into the welfare state, the middle classes who no longer had to find school fees unless they went entirely private. Butler's own judgment on his, the effects of his act, that it was as much social as educational, welding us all into one nation, has a certain ring of truth about it. So Butler. Then we jump to Tony Crossland in the 1960s, the cheroot-smoking social libertarian Oxford Don and Labour Party philosopher. Less for what he is most famous for, declaring that if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to destroy every fucking grammar school in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. And he wasn't even responsible for Northern Ireland. <laughs> More for reinforcing the binary divide between polytechnics and universities, and here I break my no higher education rule, which, whether you regard it as good or bad, lasted for 20 years. Then, in the 1970s, the somewhat unlikely and deeply anguished figure of Keith Joseph, a man tormented by self-doubt and devoid of guile in Nigel Lawson's famous description of him. He's a giant for the introduction of the GCSE at age 16 in place of the old O-level and certificate of secondary education. The CSE's top grade pass only got you onto the bottom rung of the O-level rating and that exam divide was perpetuating the grammar secondary divide in comprehensives and amended over the years the GCSE lives with us still. The next has to be Kenneth Baker in the 1980s for what was known as Gerbil, the Great Education Reform Bill. Brilliant and brilliant, at least in his own eyes, so much of what he did lives with us. The national curriculum, mass testing, grant maintained schools, and a tiny number of city technology colleges that became the model for academies and indeed for more. My fifth is something of a cheat because it's double barreled. It's kind of called Blunkett Adonis. Uh, Blunkett for the firm insistence, which lives on, and from a Labour minister, that poverty on its own is not an excuse for lousy results, that the school system should not write off deprived children, and Adonis for that and the original Academies programme, which Blunkett, with some reservations, launched. So my five for education are <coughs> Butler, Crossland, Joseph, Baker, and Blunkett. <coughs> Idleness. Full employment. Now, here we have to break a rule because uh, normally this really is in the hands of prime ministers and chancellors. So clearly, Attlee and his cabinet and their conservative successors who stuck to full employment. And the next giants, and remember the test here is did they make a difference, are Thatcher and Howe, 
who broke with full employment, substituting monetarism with effects we all know, both good and bad, which included three million unemployed. And then for pretty much the opposite reasons, Ken Clark and Gordon Brown as chancellors. Now they couldn't be more different, could they? I mean, Ken the devil may care, jazz loving, hush puppet, pro-European, who is definitely the best prime minister we've ever had. And Brown, who in public at least, you know, the dour hammer from the Scots, who, the global financial crisis aside, proved to be one of the less effective prime ministers. Ken was the conservative who first accepted at scale that in the face of globalisation driving down wages in less skilled jobs, the state had a role in supporting people in work and helping them get there, rather than using the benefit system chiefly to support them on condition they did not work. And for, the, that, and for that bit there, you might actually slip in Keith Joseph again because he was the first person to introduce some form of in-work benefit. Now, Clark's programmes were chiefly pilots, but this was a huge conceptual shift and one of the really, relatively few big ones the welfare state has seen over 70 years, and one which Brown took much further with the full-blown welfare-to-work programmes, tax credits and the minimum wage, and all that lives on in universal credit. So for idleness, Attlee, Thatcher, Howe, Clark and Brown. Squalor. There's squalor for you. Housing. First name on the list is Anari Bevin, Labour's great stormy petrol, more usually remembered for the NHS. But he was also the housing minister, and it was housing, with the quarter of Britain's housing either battered or blown apart by the Blitz, that dominated the 1945 election. Bevin insisted on generous space standards for council housing, to the point where Hugh Dalton, the Labour Chancellor, dubbed him a tremendous Tory. And he refused to trade off quality for quantity. We shall, he said, be judged for a year or two by the number of houses we build. We shall be judged in 10 years' time by the type of houses we build, and would that his successors had clung to that. <laughs> Harold Macmillan must come next as he drove through a Conservative pledge to build 300,000 homes a year, even though it was under Macmillan that space standards were further shrunk and badly built high-rise took off. And then Michael Hesseltine the mace swinging Tory Tarzan, who was one of the originators and implementers of what is usually dubbed Margaret Thatcher's policy of right to buy. Now that partly changed the political map of, gen for political map of Britain for the better part of a generation, but Hesse deserves the credit, not least for his original insistence that half the proceeds of council house sales should go into new build or refurbishment, a stipulation the Treasury ended as soon as he had left. <laughs> Would that that too had been stuck to. And then who? Well, the answer is nobody. Now, sure, there have been subsequent ministers who did good. Nick Rainsford for Labour, for example, or David Curry for the Conservatives. But there's no giant, which tells you almost all you need to know about housing today. The market is broken, in the words of both Sadhu Javid, Community Secretary, and Theresa May, the Prime Minister. So there are only three names here. There's Bevan, Macmillan, and Hesseltine, and a couple of blanks. Want or poverty, social security. This is a trickier one. Now, beverage, obviously, if he'd been a minister, but another rule broken, the key credit must go to Hugh Dalton, at least chancellor, who, with a song in my heart, found the money to implement modern social security. The next choice is Barbara Castle, flame-haired, ferocious, fiery, and quite clearly the best woman prime minister we've never had. <laughs> Her tenure saw the legislation for child benefit and a whole clutch of new disability benefits, which were essentially bipartisan, picked up from the work of Keith Joseph before, but she got them through, along with SERPs, the State Earnings Related Pension Scheme, which, for all the fact that it was cut back heavily within a decade by Norman Fowler, the opposition spokesman who waved it through the Commons without a substantive vote against, uh, actually was key because it produced a final settlement with private pensions that proved lasting, allowing for final salary schemes to thrive. So it made a lasting difference, even though it was heavily reduced very soon after its introduction. And Fowler is my third. <clears throat> Not for cutting SERPs in a way that led to a serious pensions uh, mis-selling scandal, but for launching a mighty cunctata like review of Social Security that saw off his party's right wing at a time when they were prepared to slash and burn everything. And that was making a difference by stopping something, which may sound odd, but it had a lasting effect. 
Next comes the Pensions Commission, which would make Adair Turner its chair my third, only he wasn't a minister, but it takes us to John Hutton and Steve Webb. Hutton was the Labour minister who stood up to the wrath of Gordon Brown to insist the Turner recommendations went ahead, and Steve Webb, the Liberal Democrat minister in the coalition, who finally implemented it all, rebuilding the basic state pension and introducing auto-enrolment. He's famous for saying he wanted the word single state pension engraved on his tombstone, <laughs> and he's more or less got there. And he and Hutton between them took the basic state pension from a bad place to a better one, and while auto-enrolment is in its infancy, stands at least a chance of restoring, if not a golden or silver age to private pension savings, at least perhaps a bronze one. So for Social Security, it's Dalton, Castle, Fowler, Hutton and Webb, which leaves health, the most iconic part of the welfare state. Well, Bevan, obviously. And then, shudder as you may, Enoch Powell, the lost empire proto-monetarist in the days before his Rivers of Blood speech. In 1962, this ex-Treasury Dry got from the Treasury the capital for the NHS's first proper hospital building program, 14 years after its foundation, during which hardly anything new had been built. And that, in a sense, created the District General Hospitals with which we still live. And for his famous Water Towers speech, in which, in apocalyptic language, he announced the closure of the great Victorian lunatic asylums. The defences we have to storm, he declared. The fortresses that need to be placed on a funeral pyre, even if it then took 30 years to actually close the last of them down. And then Castle again, not for the awful and debilitating dispute over private beds in the NHS, which in a bitter irony turned her into the patron saint of private medicine, but for a whole series of what sounded like, what sounded like very technical decisions, but which have had a lasting impact. And they include changing the way revenue is attributed to new hospital build and starting the formula that distributes NHS cash more fairly around the country and putting more money pretty much for the first time into the so-called Cinderella services, mental health, care of the elderly, children's services, things we still worry about today. And then Ken Clark again, for the introduction of the purchase of provider split, or the so-called NHS internal market, which 25 years on from 1991 lives with the still, even if it is now slowly dying. And then Alan Milburn, Labour's Geordie equivalent to Ken, and as adamantine in dealing with opposition as Ken and Anaira and Bevan. Milburn first for reviving a much more sophisticated version of that quasi-market, and then, and if for nothing else, getting huge amounts of cash out of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown that transformed NHS waiting times and rescued the service from one of the worst periods in its history. So health is Bevan, Powell, Castle, Clark, and Milburn. Now, of course, all these lists are highly debatable, and that's part of the fun of it. And as soon as any sort of value judgment creeps in, as I in places have allowed it to, you could end up with a very different list. I mean, if you take just health, if the test is founded as one thing, left it as another with lasting effects, then should Keith Joseph be in there for the mighty 1974 reorganisation of the NHS? And the answer is probably yes. Or Andrew Lansley, for in 2012, the biggest and quite possibly the worst structural reorganisation since then. I couldn't quite bring myself to bring Andrew in there, though I admit that's a value judgment too. And before Julian comments all this and you respond, I can hear someone saying, but what about Michael Gove or Ian Duncan Smith? Well, the answer is partly that it takes time to make a real judgment, and in Gove's case, I'm unconvinced, breaking my own rule again, that seeking to turn all schools into academies will genuinely, genuinely produce improvement when that's led to both the parent voice and the democratic one being squeezed out, and when some academy chains are now simply replicating the failures they were meant to address. And as for IDS, well, if universal credit ever makes it, just maybe. So what's notable about my list of the five giant ministers? Well, plenty, which you can now debate. But one notable thing is that in housing, there have been only three, which tells you something. And of the remaining 23, 11 turn out to be Conservative and 11 Labour. <laughs> Bevan, Castle and Clark each scoring twice, and there's one Liberal Democrat. Which, given that the welfare state's close association with the 1945 Labour government, and the fact that it's Labour which tends to claim ownership of it, is not what you might initially have expected. So, food for thought. 
the debate begin? Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick. A, a, a provocative list, um, which actually, by and large, I agree with. There are one or two little bits here and there that uh, we might uh, discuss. What I did have a look at was to see whether there was any, what was in common about these? What, what actually makes a giant minister, other than height or absence thereof? Um, and um, I, I looked at uh, a number of things to see whether there was any kind of pattern that I could oh. find. And first of all, I discussed their politics. And of course, as Nick has just said, there's nothing in it for the politics. They're, they're broadly spread across. There's no particular reason. It is quite interesting, I think, though, that the, I, I, I leave it to others to make the final judgment on this, but most of the conservative reforms were fairly radical, whereas the Labour ones were more consolidation. And you could sort of view it as, in some senses, that Labour had actually set up the welfare state, and then the Labour, and then conservatives wanted to change it in directions in which they approved or whatever. However, nonetheless, the fact is that, the, that many of the major changes, and changes for the good, and many, some, some of them uh, were conservative as much as they were Labour. Um, I looked at their education, um, and what a surprise. Um, Eleven of them went to public school. Um, eight of them conservative, three Labour, um, four to grammar school. Actually, an interesting point there is that the only two women on the list, Barbara Castle and Margaret Thatcher, were two of the women who went to grammar school, which maybe tells you something about what the, the independent girls' schools were doing at that time, uh, <coughs> that um, to get really, um, to make a real significant change, people had to go through grammar school in order to uh, let succeed. Comprehensive, two Labour, um, one the middle Democrat. Uh, <coughs> David Blunkett went to a special school for the blind. Um, and one person had um, uh, no education at all. Well, I exaggerate slightly. Um, which was an Aaron Bevan. Um, he had no education post-13. Or having said that, no school education. He did go to the Central Labour College uh, later on at the stage. Um, but so there's not much going on there. I mean, not much that I think one would learn from to today. Um, uh, university, well, surprise, surprise. Um, one LSE uh, postgraduate, um, at least in Nick's list. Um, however, there is one major omission that Nick has um, forgotten to include. Uh, and um, he will burn in hell for this, but we will, um, we will talk about, him, about that in a moment. Um, subject, well, there was quite an interesting thing here that surprises me. It was interesting that nine uh, had done law, at least at some point in their, in their degree, and six had done economics. Four of them had done PP at, at, at Oxford. Um, and that, I think, is quite interesting. I mean, I do remember um, a, uh, um, a, uh, somebody who went on to become quite a famous lawyer in the United States, Bruce Ackerman, t telling me in great detail once about uh, what a good um, education for being a politician, a lawyer was, that you learn how to make a case, you learn how to cope in adversarial situations, um, you learn how to pick things up quickly and so on. And of course many legislators in the US are indeed lawyers and indeed many legislators in the UK. So it is quite interesting that it shows up here as a significant uh, factor. Um, and the only other thing I came out um, with uh, in terms of uh, comment concerned uh, uh, Labour. Um, they virtually all, all the reformers, had some connection with the Fabian Society. Um, those of you who haven't come across the Fabian Society, it was the, actually, it was officially the founder of the LSE, um, and uh, it, uh, it is named after um, a Roman general who was famous for his delays, um, and the idea is that uh, essentially the Fabian Society got, she believes in revolution, but slow revolution, gradual revolution, gradual reform. Um, okay, now, but what about um, the mistake that, um, that uh, Nick made? Um, um, well, I hope this works. Um, but, uh, uh, Hmm? 
It will work eventually. Mm. I hope. <coughs> okay. Well, as most of you will know, um, uh, but perhaps not all, that was the Minister for Administrative Affairs, uh, Jim Hacker, and the Permanent Secretary of the Department, uh, Sir Humphrey Appleby. And what few of you may know is that Jim Hacker went to the LSE, <laughs> uh, which caused much amusement to the civil servants, who, of course, all went to Oxbridge. Uh, I can't think why Nick omitted, them from, from the, from, omitted him from his list, um, because, of course, in some ways, he's the most well-known minister of all, certainly internationally, uh, and indeed, in some ways, the most influential. Uh, of course, the nature of his influence is a strange one, um, and perhaps a little different from the others that we've been considering, in that he had no influence at all. Uh, and that was because he was blocked at every point by Sir Humphrey, doing his uh, civil servant blockage. Now, there is a serious point here. Um, uh, we're focusing here on ministers and radical reform, but we do need to think about the role of others uh, in this, the other key players in this, uh, civil servants and special advisors. Uh, uh, special advisors are people brought in by ministers in order to help them uh, drive through reform. In full disclosure, I was a for a couple of years a special advisor uh, under Tony Blair. Um, but let's have a think about civil servants. Is their role essentially a Sir Humphrey one, that of blocking any minister with the temerity to try to engineer radical change of any kind, whether it's anti-discrimination policies, uh, as in that case, uh, or, uh, or radical welfare reform more generally? Um, well, I was a special, when I was a special advisor um, during the Blair government, we were trying to drive through some of the radical reforms, Alan Milburn's reforms that were stated there. Um, I was actually a successor to Simon Stevens, um, who um, is now running the NHS. Um, and uh, both these reforms, these radical reforms, Alan Milburn's and, uh, uh, and Simon, they were, they, were, they were their babies in a sense. Um, and um, it was extraordinarily difficult. Indeed, my experience was very much a Sir Humphrey-type experience. Um, one of the policies we were trying to introduce at the time was independent sector treatment centres. These were privately run specialist units 
uh, specialising in a few simple operations like cataracts, hip replacements, knee replacements, and so on. We had very long waiting lists for those, people waiting a year or more, um, some 18 months for these very simple operations. And so we were going to introduce these new specialist units, privately run, uh, and uh, they were supposed to provide some extra capacity to reduce the waiting times, but also a measure of competition um, with, the, with the NHS itself. Um, and for that reason, there were key figures in the NHS and the Department of Health who were uh, deeply opposed to it. And it was rather remarkable the way that opposition sort of panned out. I remember going to, we went, we agreed that, that on the whole, these operations, um, we'd have about 500,000 of these operations being done by these specialist units. They do about 500,000. Um, and yet, every time I went to a meeting um, prepared by civil servants, uh, there would be papers prepared by the civil servants for the meeting, and the number would be less. It was 300,000 one meeting. The following meeting, it was 200,000. A meeting after that was 75,000. Um, uh, finally, I tackled one of the civil servants, and I said, what's going on here? And he said, my job is to keep people like you and Simon Stevens under control. Um, uh, you, are you are proposing to throw up the whole system. Uh, our job is to make sure the system continues. I mean, it was absolutely blatant. So I, was, I, was, I was stunned, really. Um, and we did eventually get our 500,000, but we, at least into the papers, although the, when the policy turned out, not as many as that. But the way I did it was um, uh, actually by Tony Blair's suggestion, which was we, could, we put the number into a speech um, that Tony Blair was making. And from then on, we could always say, well, the Prime Minister is on record as having said 500,000, and therefore that what must we have. And incidentally, that's a worth, tip worth making for those of you who, um, who may ever get into an advisory role. Uh, it's very useful to get things into Prime Ministerial speeches uh, to make sure that they, they do actually happen. Um, um, bring, it brings me to my final point. Um, I wasn't a very good special advisor, um, but I did work with people who were. Um, Simon Stevens was one of them. Uh, and there was another one um, uh, who, uh, who did actually become a minister, uh, and indeed Nick mentioned briefly in the contact with David Blunkett, um, although I think his principal work was done when he was a special advisor. Andrew Adonis, um, father of the Academy's policy, uh, and without whom it would never have happened. He drove it through. He drove it through from 10 Downing Street, uh, interestingly. Um, and uh, again, much to the horror of the civil servants who actually rang up the Prime Minister occasion to try and call him off, um, but failed in the process. Um, so, how do we make a radical Minister of Welfare reform? Well, do law at university, uh, perhaps some economics. Uh, and note, instead, that the LSE has some of the top departments in both law and economics. Um, you don't have to be Labour. Um, some of the most effective reformers were Conservatives. But if you are Labour, join, join the Fabian Society. Uh, and finally, appoint a powerful and effective special advisor, someone who understands the politics and who can deal with the circumference of this world, like Simon Stevens and Andrew Adonis, and even, dare I say it, someone who I've always thought would make an excellent advisor had he not chosen the distinguished journalism role, Nicholas Timmons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let me start with uh, the obvious question. Some say that we are living in an era of political pygmies. Um, as you look at the current landscape, where do you see leadership on welfare reform coming from? Maybe start with Nick. <laughs> well, I think, but, I mean, you always feel at the time that you're dealing with pygmies, I think. I mean, I, I, mean, I, have a, you know, I was briefly a lobby correspondent for five or six years and we were looking at the, uh, so was the, I was there for the fall of Thatcher and the rise of Blair, so to speak, that period. Uh, and I do remember a conversation with Tony Bevins, a particular editor, when we were looking at the Tory cabinet in the late 90s, and we were thinking, God, these people, you know, I mean, honestly, they, what a shower, what a shambles, you know. Uh, but actually, there were some quite effective ministers in there. Uh, I mean, someone I didn't mention, but Peter Lilly, 
mm. he has his reputation of being an extreme right winger, was actually quite a subtle reformer of social security. So I think it's quite, you know, when you look at it now, you say who's important. I mean, you know, universal credit is enormously controversial. Uh, if it ever actually does get up there running, you know, you'd have said it's IDS's baby. You'd have seen it through. Um, but at the moment, one doesn't feel one is surrounded by giants, by definition. I think I would say Michael Gove. Um, I mean, he's not actually in the welfare field at the moment, although, of course, mm. he has a bit of education and so on. But uh, he is, um, I have worked with him a bit, and he is, he's a radical minister, and he's a minister who does face down the, the civil service, um, and, um, and indeed the, edu the establishment in various ways, um, and gets into a lot of flack for it. But actually, I do think that, um, I think that he is, uh, I think he, can, he could take things forward, at least in the welfare area. Mm. Okay, now having been a former Sir Humphrey myself, <laughs> I feel the need to defend the civil servants just a little bit. Um, some of the proposals that one has heard uh, are, um, are not very good. Um, <laughs> and sometimes having s sort of sensible people block them is in the national interest. Say a little bit about um, the role of civil say a little more about the role of civil servants and the role of politicians well, in this field. I think it's very mixed, actually, because, I mean, there are... There certainly have been periods where individual departments have, in a sense, had their policy, which they want to... You know, ministers come, ministers go. I mean, education's had a dose of that at various times. But it's also been done for good purposes, too. So, you know, throughout the 1990s, the civil service and Anna Langlis, who was chief executive, uh, when all the turmoil was going on about the Tory internal market, was clinging on to an agenda about quality and safety uh, and about better value for money that they sort of clung to through all that. And, you know, the ideas like NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, came out of work they had quietly been doing in the background as civil servants so that when a government came in that was receptive to it, it, was not, it wasn't there on a plate, but, it, you know, the, the essential core ideas were there. So sometimes the civil service desire to, in a sense, you know, stop really daft things, but also try and keep themes people have launched and then forgotten about and come back to. Uh, I mean, just to take a current example, you know, the current mantra in the NHS is all about integration uh, and quality. Well, you know, if you go back, Patricia Hewitt had a paper on integration back in 2006. Uh, which is talking about many things we're talking about now, and Aridazi did his high quality care for all stuff, which was about quality, mm -hmm. and you think if that had been seen through, rather than Andrew Lance's great massive structural reorganisation, we would be in a much better place. And, you know, the, the civil service has kept chipping away at that, so that when someone gets around to it, there's been a bit of advance done. So, it, it could be a mixed bag. It could be a mixed bag. Well, yes, I, I must also um, um, not only apologise to you, but apologise to my daughter, who, who is a civil servant and who, who, works, in, who works in your old department, actually, in, in the Department of International Development. Uh, and, um, uh, yes, I mean, obviously, it, it's easy to do a Sir Humphrey and, and, a, and a character. And, in fact, I was a little unfair in the story I told because the person I spoke to, um, or who told me, was not actually a traditional civil servant. Mm. It was very interesting that actually when I worked um, in government, um, the Department of Health, out of 28 um, civil servants, or the top civil servants, 27 of them were not Sir Humphrey Appleby's in the sense they were not people who had come up through the civil service ranks. They were ex-NHS managers. Mm. Effectively, the Department of Health had been captured by the NHS. Mm. Uh, and I'm told that's happened in a number of departments that, that often the, 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 the move, I mean, ironically, really, the move away from the, um, the, uh, the civil service has actually, um, from the traditional civil service, has actually caused, and of course, uh, 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 sorry, has caused a recruitment of people from the service delivery itself. And of course, they are the most conservative of all, because when you attack, when you try to reform their service, they're saying they're, you're attacking their careers, you're attacking their friends who are still in jobs, um, you're attacking their whole sort of the whole rationale. 
So, in many ways, I'd almost prefer the Humphrey Appleby to deal with it. Okay, yeah, very nice. good. <laughs> very good. That's a very good state of the world. <laughs> Let me now turn to the audience for questions and comments. There are some roving mics around, and please just introduce yourself and, uh, and ask your question. Lady here. Um, hi, my name's Natasha. Um, thanks for that. Um, it, it gave me a good whistle stop through politics over the last ages. Um, it, it's very obvious looking at those photos, the sort of lack of diversity, and, and you touched on it a bit in your background. Um, I guess I just wondered whether the lack of diversity is simply that we haven't had as many sort of diverse politicians going through, or whether there's something about the fact that if you've had to fight um, because you've come from a different ethnic background, you've come from some kind of problematic base, you, 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 you're female, you, you've just had to fight that much harder to get that, that you don't have the political space to then be able to do something radical or giant um, to quite the same extent as to someone who's, who's come up without perhaps that kind of adversity. Maybe Julian, well, I, yeah. I, I think I would, well... I think you should probably <laughs> comment on that. I mean, I, th I think that, I mean, there's some, there seems to be something to that, isn't yeah. there? I mean, I don't think these welfare ministers were atypical of the cabinet that mm. they were serving in. Yeah. No? I mean, I don't think there was something unique about welfare. I think they were reflecting the time, no? Yes, I think that's right. I, know, I, think, I think that's right. And it is interesting that the two, I mean, they were, they were extremely powerful women, as, as, as we know, the two, the two who are there. Um, and they'd obviously had to fight much harder than their equivalent, their male equivalents, to get yeah. where they where they got to, yeah. um, which made them that much more effective, of course, in many ways. Yeah. I mean, Castle was fantastic, yeah. just fantastic. I mean, force of nature. <laughs> no. But but I have, I mean, just to answer your question more directly, I have heard um, women who were ministers talk about the huge amounts of. Um, undermining and harassment mm -hmm. that they experienced in their roles. And I know some of them have spoken to me quite candidly about how other women from other, even for, including from other parties, gave them huge amounts of support against, against their own often mm -hmm. uh, in times of stress when, uh, when they were put under huge pressure. So yes, mm -hmm. it's definitely, definitely an issue. And there, you know, there are paradoxes about it too. I mean, Margaret Thatcher may have been the first woman prime minister. She's not famous for actually encouraging women, <laughs> which is, Slightly odd yeah. position to be in, you might think. Okay, how about here and then the gentleman in the middle there? I'm Martin Sandbury from the Financial Times. Uh, thanks very much. I'd like you to address uh, briefly the very special, special situation the public finances have been in for the last eight years. Because the depth and the duration of the fiscal consolidation has really been something unprecedented in the lifetime of the modern welfare state. And that comes on top of an unprecedented squeeze on market incomes from large parts of the population. So, uh, I mean, isn't, doesn't that uh, mean that all the people whose images are on your slide really had a much easier time of it than anyone would have trying to carry out radical reforms today? Or is that letting today's politicians off too easily? Uh, I'm not sure that's right. I mean, the 70s were pretty bloody grim. Uh, the IMF came in. Uh, people forget how rough times were. I mean, the 70s were pretty awful. The NHS was not in a good state at all then. I mean, it goes through periodic crises. So, you know, the 70s were not, the end of the 70s were not good. Um, now, of course, you know, this is sustained long period of austerity uh, without any terribly obvious end to it, and that clearly is putting pressure on all sorts of things all over the place. And, you know, that, well, this is not my neck of the woods, but, you know, there's, there's kind of a fundamental question coming up, isn't there, which is how much, what proportion of GDP are we prepared to spend, raising taxes and spend? And it's coming to a crunch mm. at some point. I'm not sure whether the crunch is next couple of years, five years, but it's visible. Mm. So either at that point, a political party or both political parties will accept there's a need to spend a bit more, therefore tax a bit more, or services will get really, really, really squeezed badly. Yeah, just to follow on on that, there is, you know, when you have a former permanent secretary of the Treasury arguing for a hypothecated tax to fund the NHS because yeah. people's willingness to pay more tax is just not there unless it's hypothecated. And those of you who know the Treasury dogma, hypothecation is about as close to original sin as you can get yes. in fiscal yeah. policy. Uh, 
What do you think of that? Well, I've that long say? been an advocate of hypothecation, so um, I, I support that particular idea. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, in general, um, uh, there's been a number of radical changes over the past few years that have not been affected by so. I mean, Michael Gove driving through the Academies program, for example, um, and also um, um, Lansley's, Lansley's change, which um, uh, looks as though it is one of the most biggest disasters that have ever happened. Um, but uh, and without passing value judgment on it, it, it nonetheless is a significant, a significant change. I, I think that, I mean, there have been some... Um, some uh, dreadful acts of policy vandalism, such as getting rid of the Child Trust Fund, which was one of my babies, um, and they're very sad that has gone, um, and hope to revive at some point. But um, but I don't. Um, so, in some sense, if there have been radical changes, some of those radical changes have been getting rid of things rather than um, uh, incre increasing things. But no, I think on the whole, austerity has not got in the way of um, of radical change. Um, just on the hypothecation, I'm on the different side of the argument to Julian on hypothecated taxes. I think it's a terrible idea, but uh, but I mean, it, you know, it, it, why? It, why? Well, because it's dishonest. Uh, because you never, you know, you hypothecate a tax, it never raises what you think is the right amount of money. So, if it's if it's genuinely hypothecated, so supposing we have a tax that actually sends out to raise quite a lot more than we thought it would, do we suddenly spend more money on NHS just because it's there? And if it doesn't raise enough, you have to top it up. And it's always going to be out of cycle. And, we've, and, I, and I think, I mean, I can see it, it might well be the way the money is raised now. But each time you do it, it turns out not to be honest. You discredit the idea more. I mean, Gordon Brown, if you remember, raised national insurance to pay for the, some of the, the big increase in spending to the NHS. And it didn't all go on the NHS. You know, I think every time you do this, you, de you devalue the idea. I think hypothecated tax is a really good idea for capital, but not for revenue. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Dean that used to be in The Guardian when Nick was on the FT. Uh, Nick, when you were trying to say the 70s are as bad as today, can I just point out a few things? Uh, here was a government that got into power saying they would put their poor and vulnerable at the front head of their parties right throughout those five years when Cameron was leader of the Tories and trying to make it uh, look good. Uh, and now, what, are we, what did they do as soon as they got in? £30 billion of cuts to welfare were a signal. The, BB, the local authorities have lost 50% yeah. of their budgets with the consequences on young people and on libraries. On, you the whole, go, go through the whole thing. Housing, awful. So, going back to your picture, when you said Steve Webb's pension, it might have been marginally better uh, financially than the rest, but f the new pension, if you're lucky enough to get it, and a lot of people aren't going to get it, is £160 a week. The, uh, uh, <coughs> the medium wage is £26,000, which is about £520 a week, which means even if you're on that medium pension, you're in poverty. You're 60% below the median. I c and that's why we've got to remove him, even though I used to be in the same party as him. And he is a good chap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose the, the counter to that is, I mean, the, you know, for donkey's years, the basic state pension was worth around about a quarter of average earnings. And it's, that's kind of where it's going to end up under this. So in a sense, we've gone through 30 years of tortuous history to get back to where we were in 1981. <laughs> you know, um, so, I mean, I think, given where it was, it's in a better place, which is not to say it's perfect. Lady at the back. Hello, thank you. My name's Susan Balding. Um, thank you for your presentations. I'm having a problem seeing all these people as giants, frankly. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is because I think we need to see, um, if you call somebody radical or a giant, you've got to contextualise that. And I don't think any of these people popped out of the woodwork and made great changes. I think in most instances, they will have been a reflection of an ideological movement that has been going along and crisscrossing parties at the same time. And so take, for instance, your example of the NHS. Um, as Simon Stevens um, and 
Jeremy Hunt, uh, Oliver Letwin, many of those were involved in ideological work much earlier, trying to um, make the case for a reduced role of the state um, in all areas, and particularly within the NHS. Um, the fact that these ideas have been picked up, Alan Milburn implemented some of the private initiative programs that had already been mooted by Tory ideologues. Um, and so I don't see how then these people can be represented as giants. And just to your point about special advisors, I think the reason possibly that civil service might be obstructive there is because the civil servants will have been appointed and the special advisors have been elected. <laughs> I lost the very end of that. Um, well, look. Special advisors haven't been elected. No, they're not elected. Absolutely, they're not elected. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, it's partly a part again. So the giant bit is actually who who did who implemented something. So quite often, if you look at some of the stuff that Barbara Carson implemented on benefits was actually the products of some cross-party work. I mean, there was a wonderful spat in the House of Commons when it went through between Geoffrey Howe and Barbara Castle about whose idea this really was. So you do get sort of trends, if you want a better word, where things are clearly, yeah, the state pensions, they've been trying to reform for 30 years by the time SERPs came through. So clearly there are things that are a longer term trend, as you say, context specific. So my giant is the one who actually finally got it done. Um, so, of course, it's. I mean, I'm not saying any of these people dreamt up a brand new idea totally out of their head, made it up as they, you know, the beverage report had at least as much continuity in it as it had change. So, you're right, but I'm playing the parlour game of who actually did it. <laughs> Gentleman in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned, um, well, I think of all the people, two prime ministers, Clement Attlee and Harold McMullen. Now, Harold McMullen was a conservative prime minister. I, he, he, um, he's usually known for that, said, so you've never had it so good. But um, d what, d did he actually increase the welfare state, that, uh, the Labour Party? Could you say anything about Harold McMullen's policies towards the welfare state? You did mention him. It would be interesting to have a few more details on that. I didn't quite get that. Oh, McMillan's contribution to the welfare state. Well, I mean, as a housing ministry, he built a hell of a lot of houses. Um, uh, well, you could argue, you know, he fired half his treasury rather than make the cuts they wanted to. You could take that as a contribution. And, of course, it was the Millen government that approved the Anderson and Robbins report, which produced the fantastic expansion of higher education, which we are sitting in the middle of at the moment. So, and, and he clearly was behind that, accepting Rob, first Anderson and then Robbins. So that's a certainly a big contribution to the welfare state. And actually a bigger one if you look back, because I mean, his, his middle way book in the 1930s, he was part of the post-war adjustment by the Conservative Party to what Labour had done and, you know, and basically the Conservative acceptance that there was going to be a, more, a larger and more expanded welfare state. Differences about how big it would be, differences about how far it went, but an acceptance of the basic proposition. So he was crucial in all that. And then here. Uh, Harry Quarterpenner, IPPR. Um, I'm interested, you know, Tony Blair famously once said, you know, you pull the lever in number 10 hoping that it'll do something in the, uh, in the, in the NHS or education and nothing really happens. <coughs> I'm interested, of these giants, which ones achieved what they did through, you know, in your view, a real and deep understanding of how you make change happen in, in th these kind of systems? And which ones had lots of external things that helped them make this change, or it was the, mo the, the moment was ripe and it all went their way. Which ones really, really understood how to drive change through? What a good question. <laughs> what a good question. <laughs> um, 
Well, I think Ken Clark did, just by sort of being Ken Clark. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, the, all the, I mean, the mega row with the doctors over the internal market. Uh, and then, you know, Maggie was so worried about the row he caused, she moved into education. He probably started another bloody great row with the teachers. Uh, I mean, here was someone who, who, in a sense, almost made change by force of personality. Uh, and I think the same is true of Bevan. Force of personality makes a big difference. Same is true of Castle, you know, who, who would just go and do things. Yes, I think there's some, I think there's political nous there as well. One of the things about the quasi market in, um, in healthcare, the, the internal market that, um, uh, that uh, Kenneth Clark introduced was he, di he divided the doctors because he set up the GP fund holding scheme alongside the hospital. And he said, in some sense, he said GPs against the consultants, which was actually quite a clever move and gave considerable power to GPs vis a vis the, the consultants. And I think, uh, I think you could probably look at some of these other changes and you could see that there were, there was some quite shrewd political manoeuvring. Marlborough Castle, probably another one, actually. Um, that, that lay behind it. So it was, it was a little more, I think, it wasn't just bulldozing, I think. Okay, in the back. Um, my question is, do you think part of being a great minister or one of the great reformers is having people coming after you who leave your reforms alone? Because currently being a primary school teacher, I've lived through Michael Gove's academy reforms and many other changes. And already, some of them are starting to be unpicked, some for the better, some for the worse. And do you think some of these people are simply they were lucky enough to be followed by either inactive ministers or ministers who are happy and agreed with their reforms, while there are other ministers who may have made great changes, but a year or two later, they're moved, person comes in, revolves, changes, undoes. And then, yeah, I was just wondering what your opinions are on that. Uh, yeah, I think there's an awful lot of, well, uh, 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 one of my favorite quotes is Geoffrey Otten who was a permanent secretary at the Department of Social Security, who once said, you have to remember that every minister who came through here wanted to leave his or her mark on the system, and very few of them failed entirely. <laughs> and so you know, there's a politician's drive to leave a mark, so you do tend to get things changed by your successors, whether you like it or not, uh, because politicians understandably want to make a mark. Uh, so things quite often get turned around and turned over. Uh, I mean, or someone judges someone went too far. I mean, if you look at the history of the NHS in the 2000s, the number of reorganisations it went through, all under a Labour government, when the number of PCTs went from, you know, five, 450 down to 150, the number of health authorities went from, I can't, re I can't remember the numbers that exactly right off the top of my head, but from 14 to 4 and then to 10 and to, to 28, and then we ended up with 10. So there is a tendency for people to do things. And long-term continuity in policy is actually relatively rare. Relatively rare. Difficult. Back here. Two, uh, two gentlemen here. And, then our, and one here. OK. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, all these five giants obviously have links between them and you know, thinking, for example, idleness and uh, so unemployment and education, for example, health and your housing. Were there any ministers that saw the bigger picture, you think, and managed to link across these kind of <coughs> five giants? Think about that for a minute. Um, Keith Church. <coughs> lots of them sort of worked across things. I mean, it, it's 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 part of the I mean, part of the problem is the nature of government, isn't it? In that you know, it's been constructed in silos and departments forever, and it's very it's it just proves remarkably difficult to get into the departmental working. Uh, I'm not an expert on Scotland, but Scotland has actually made a genuine effort to try and reconstruct the way its ministries function to try and address some of those. But I don't know how well that's worked. Uh, but, you know, they have, they have tried to get out of the silos that say education, health, you know, employment or whatever, uh, by creating broader cross-cutting 
cross-cutting ministries. I just don't know how well that's gone. And I guess it would actually take you a decade to find out. Uh, Mike Parker um, prefaced my remark by saying I've just recently become 70. And if the, that had been given out as part of a pub quiz, uh, I could have recognized all of them other than Nick Webb and, and John Hutton. Uh, but my question is about the media. Um, how much do you think the media play a role in creating the giants? Does the media play a role in creating the giants? In what sense? Well, building up the characters, the names of yeah. the individuals. I mean, if you went out in the street now and asked people to name ministers, yeah. they could probably name May and Boris and yeah. very few other folks. How much can the media build up people who eventually would get on that list? Malcolm? <laughs> What's the answer to that question? <laughs> Um, I think we do more. We do more harm to policy, to policy construction. We always look for that. It's no wonder people in Britain don't believe Brexit is going to happen because they get negative coverage. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the media like big characters, don't they? I mean, you know, every, well, in a sense, everybody likes big characters. So some, sometimes, I mean, Boris is the classic example, for heaven's sake. Um, so it's kind of a f sort of feedback loop, isn't it? you're big enough and bouncy enough personality, you get more coverage. Because the last two questions, I'll take them together, just because we're running short of time. The gentleman here and the lady in the frame there. Peter Jones, on Emeritus Governor here. Um, I think conviction politics are bad, and uh, analytical politics are probably good. And we at LSE obviously favour the analytical approach. Do you think there's enough, enough analysis gone in to produce the kind of things like the Robbins Report and the Beveridge Report originally? Are those sorts of reports that have an independent element to them, but very factually based? Mm. Have they gone completely out of fashion? And the lady in the well, there, well, I was here at the time of 1955-57, doing social science at the time of Brian Abel Smith and, and, and Professor Titmus. And Professor Titmus, in fact, didn't have a degree, did he? I believe he wrote a great book on sociology. But what I'm really raising up is my concern about the health service, because I don't see how we can get out of the situation of debt, since in order to finance the, the social, these health service <laughs> hospitals, we, we persuaded other people to build them, and the people who built them then decide on all, you know, complete control over them. And you hear the same thing with education, and you hear some headmaster saying, I could have had that plug mended by my own electrician for 25 pounds, or I could have had this done, and we can't because these people are coming in and charging whatever they feel like and even charging more if they have to come back again. So I don't see how we can fracture any of these deals we've made. You know, where people go bankrupt in the business world, but somehow these people can stay on forever. And all this embezzling that's gone on of people's pension funds is pretty horrific. So okay. I'm just moaning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Moaning, private provision, and the future of analytical policy making. Uh, well, the only thing I would just say about the private provision point is that, and I shall <coughs> rather uh, launch an unfashionable defence of the private finance initiative, um, in the sense that I mean, and I do remember um, some minister talking to me once about. It. He said the great thing about it was um, uh, that. Uh, I used to go to, I used to go to uh, various, when well, no, I was an MP, I used to go to various uh, towns and they would say, come and see our new hospital and, um, uh, and they would point to a hole in the ground and they say that hole in the ground has been there for 10 years. Um, after PFI, we got the new hospital. Um, and although they were all, and I, I agree that many of those deals are terrible deals, um, but nonetheless, the fact is that the hospitals are there, and, and they weren't there before, and um, that uh, is, is at least some justification for them. I pick up the analytical point. Um, well, royal commissions are out of favour, but we still commission expert quote-unquote reports, so, you know, Turner, Dilnot, more recently, Dilnot got legislated for, hasn't happened. Um, and something we've not really talked about, but, but, but for these things to happen, there's, 
you know, there's timing and luck mm. and judgment. It goes back to the context point, in a sense. Because if, if you take Turner, auto-enrolment was a new idea, and it solved a battle. There'd been a long battle going on about should we have compulsory <coughs> pension contributions from everybody, and that, that argument had been running for ages, and auto-enrolment kind of finessed it by saying you, you can be enrolled in... The raising of the state pension age, every politician knew that in the face of demography that had to happen. And in a sense, Turner was the one who said, it's going to happen. And everybody said, oh, thank heaven someone said it. <laughs> and you can move it. So there's a timing point, and that's a matter of judgment, but also a matter of luck. There's been a bow wave building up of recognition that, you know, as the popula is a population ages and lives much longer, state pension age would have to rise. And Turner caught the moment. So, it, and, you know, still not turned out not to have caught the moment. Yeah. So, you know, there's, in, in these really big changes, there can often be a long run up and somebody at the moment makes the right judgment, makes the right call at the right time, so it happens. Okay, thank you very much. I think you've made us appreciate that giants can come at the most unusual moments uh, and in the most unlikely uh, <laughs> shapes and sizes, although they do have some definite similarities. Uh, and, that, uh, and that welfare reform occurs in big bursts like beverage, but also in lots of incremental tweaks. And that's probably a fairly hopeful message for the current circumstances in which there's a real sense that something must be done, uh, but also a sense of this is very daunting and how can we do it all at once? And maybe that combination of unlikely giants and incremental tweaks can get us to a better place. So thank you very much, and thank you all for coming.